So welcome to uh, recordings of the first, or some of the first of our uh, research design uh, presentations for 2014. So this is EMVM 7124 and we've got Anna Petrie is going to talk to us about um, Should the Rats Go? Preserving Biodiversity on Lord Howe Island. Um, hi everyone, I'm quite happy to kick off because I'm um, happy to receive feedback about whether or not this is a good topic because I really am not so sure. Um, so my background is not in ecology or not in environmental management, so I had trouble narrowing down a topic. Um, so I felt this assignment was a bit like climbing a mountain, so this is Mount Barney, and I think I'm about where these people are at. Um, I think I've found the trail, but I'm not quite sure if it's the right way to climb the mountain or not. So um, I started my research process looking in um, to the area of genetics and biotechnology, so looking at the Biosafety um, Convention, which Australia has not yet ratified. Um, I started looking around um, genetic and modifi modified canola plants and then kind of decided that that would be quite a challenging topic because um, I wasn't really uh, familiar with importing and exporting and that's where that um, was happening. So. Um, a colleague of mine visited Lord Howe Island on holidays last year and she was talking to me about um, a rat eradication program. I knew nothing of it before Tuesday night. So this is kind of where I'm at with, um, with <coughs> this topic. Um, so essentially Lord Howe Island is a World Heritage listed island that's in New South Wales territory. Um, so off the coast of New South Wales. So it's a um, significant um, biodiversity uh, has significant biodiversity resources um, and a number of pests, both flora and faunal pests. Uh, one of which is the ship rats that came aboard in 18 or 1920, I can't remember the exact year. Um, so in terms of the way that um, I was going to approach this um, research, um, so just using the pressure state response, that was the only um, framework that I really understood or had time to grasp. Um, so at the moment I am, based on the limited amount of research that I've done so far, thinking that some of the pressures are the threats to um, species such as the giant um, stick insects and the Lord Howe wood hen. Um, in terms of the, the state, the state of that environment at the moment, so it's World Heritage List, there's lots and lots of management programs um, that are occurring on the island at the moment. But it's also reliant, it's also got um, about 350 permanent residents and um, a tourism industry. So I see that um, lots of the problems that I imagine most, lots of you are going to tackle are the tension between the anthropocentric values of a place and the biodiversity values of a place. So I thought that was an interesting uh, place to centre my research. Um, and basically I don't, I don't know if this is a good topic, but I'm thinking um, maybe what I'm going to investigate <coughs> is one of the plans to uh, massively eradicate um, the rats, so an aerial drop of poison, um, which is supported by some members of the permanent residents, but is objected by others. Um, and so that's, I guess, where I'm, um, I'm centering on the research questions. Um, I won't go to that yet. Um, so the data that I think I'm going to use um, as the um, ecological significance or ecological effectiveness of um, eradicating, uh, a ma doing a mass eradication of a pest on an island um, as um, an aspect of the data that I'm going to look at. Um, a second source of data that I think um, I'm going to investigate um, is the effectiveness of the current management plans um, of the pest as opposed to management as opposed to eradication and then a third element of data that I thought I was going to investigate um, was like a community engage engagement strategy like what's happening with the tourism industry um, on the island and the permanent mm. residents and the impact that the eradication program would have on that I think. Um, in terms of the international regulatory significance so uh, it's a World Heritage Area um, so I'd obviously be looking at that side of things. Uh, it's um, party to a, the Convention on Biological Diversity and it's also um, regulated by the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Act. 
Australia. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where I think I'm at. So oh, I didn't describe how I was going to do my research. Do you want me to describe no, that too? No, um, Okay. I'll just lift up that microphone so that it gets hopefully picks up for people who are listening. And I might bring my over here a little bit. Um, so, uh, I really like the proposal. Uh, what I particularly like about it, you've got a clear international framework, or actually a few, but they're all consistent, and you've come down to a clear uh, case study that you're looking at. I was initially worried when you were talking about it, A, that you didn't have a particular background or interest in it, and I, I much prefer, prefer yeah, you know, that you yep. choose something that you actually like. Um, but if you do choose to do it, um, I was also worried about what <coughs> policy recommendations that you could I too am worried about that. be making, <laughs> but um, it sounded like uh, if there's this debate about the aerial baiting or other measures, um, there's probably fairly good literature on what might be effective, um, and there's been some other, like I think Macquarie Island, they've just eradicated the yep. rats, um, so you might be able to you know, look at the literature on those programs yep. to say what has been effective. Um, so you may be able to come out with some good, clear policy recommendations. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, that's, you know, the project looks fine. My only concern is that, you know, I want it to be fun as well. I'm not saying um, it won't be so fun. And the only um, recommendation that yep. I make, I think, for methods is uh, in this case, I think that a site visit is absolutely essential. <laughs> um, so I probably should write you out a letter for your That'd employer nice. yeah. saying that you should have two weeks leave to go to Lord Howe Island and <laughs> investigate the rat population <laughs> there. So <laughs> we could try. We could try. I think a site visit. If I could claim it on tax, I'd the, be happy. The, the site, a site visit is actually, I think, in this case, would be really beneficial. Field trip. <laughs> Um, uh, no, I, I'm actually, I'm happy with it from my perspective because you've got a clear focus, I can see where you're going, it's um, small enough that I can see it's doable in the time and space available, which is my main concern. Um, I just want to see that you've got a clear idea of where you're going. That's my main thing. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Or feedback. Yes. It's definitely, I used to work with the guy who is who was the general manager on Lord Howe Island, who is responsible for doing this now. And if you want to um, write <laughs> APC Consulting and see yep. if you can find out anything from a guy called Terry. Because he'll probably APC have consulting, most Terry. of the information that you might have. Fantastic. Before. Whether or not it's available publicly, I don't know, yeah. but give them a call and see. Okay. Well, so the, yeah, lady I, the lady that I got the, uh, the idea for the topic is, and is a biologist. Right. So, uh, He's a lovely guy. Yep. It's so great. APC yeah. Terry. APC Terry. Um, and do you mind if I yeah, mention marks? Um, so, um, in terms of um, marking Anna, she's happily she's happy for me to just say that um, I was going to give her five for that because I think the research design is um, clear and specific, and also she gave very clear, um, very clear presentation. Was able to answer questions well. So, from my perspective, everything looks fine. So, um, well done. Thanks. So, um, we've got another volunteer. Oh. I think you did, have your, you did have your hand up before, so I think we'll pr probably be able to fit you both in. So, yeah. can you come up? Okay, so just to explain to you what I'm doing, I'm going to hand back to Anna her marking sheet, and I've fluoroed in the um, the grade of seven, and I've just written well done. So I'm not writing down everything that I say orally, but it's a combination of just giving you some feedback. Um,
is everyone happy, comfortable with what we're doing? Um, it's really just about ensuring that you're in the right, you've got a clear idea yourself, ensuring you're in the right frame of reference, uh, and then whatever your topic is, you know, I really want you to choose something that you're happy with. <coughs> so that's our objective here. All good? Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Nick Westwood. Um, the topic that I'm choosing is um, focusing around the, the Brigalow or an acacia um, species, um, which is native to obviously Queensland and Australia and, and in New South Wales as well. But what I want to look at in my research mm -hmm. is how the Brigalow can act as a long term um, nitrogen crop and actually improve the soil. So. So the Brigalow Belt actually covers an area of probably approximately 6 million hectares, but only approximately 2% of that area is actually um, protected. One of the things that's actually really affected the Brigalow um, since probably farming in Queensland has actually um, been occurring is actually that a lot of the Brigalow has actually been um, removed, burned. Um, so, and as a result of that, there's about 30. 30, up over 30 flora and fauna species which are threatened as a result of that um, mass removal of the Brigalow species throughout obviously the dry land farming areas of Queensland. So you can see that it stretches from up near Townsville, Townsville um, right down to the border and then out, to, out past Roma. Um, that does continue, there's the southern Brigalow belt but I'm just going to focus my research around what's going to occur in Queensland. Um, part of obviously the Brigalow belt includes the Murray-Darling system as well. So obviously the Murray-Darling river system um, passes through that um, and a number of the tributaries tribu which are obviously associated with that. So you can see obviously um, the percentage of obviously the, the remaining Brigalow has been affected primarily through obviously farming practices as I've explained. And you can see through the areas that are obviously red and orange <coughs> and yellow, that's obviously a majority where the Brigalow belt is actually contained. So Though all those areas through that um, are actually certain the, certainly the red areas. Um, there's actually less than 10% of the remaining vegetation um, in the environment. So my research um, hopes to show that um, by looking at the Brigalow from a different perspective, we can actually overcome obviously the ongoing, in some cases, the ongoing destruction of it. Although it's quite very well protected. Um, there is some um, evidence of obviously still removal occurring. So what can obviously the Brigalow provide to the environment? Well the Brigalow, like a pea or a bean, is a legume. So it acts as a nitrogen store. So it actually will actually capture nitrogen um, around its root systems um, and then actually allow the obviously as, as the root systems and the plants obviously move through their life cycle they release that nitrogen back into the environment, which obviously essentially nitrogen is essentially <coughs> a building block which all plants need to grow. Uh, it's predominantly obviously one of the key roles is obviously around cell development but also leaf development. So a question I, I posed was, you know, cleared lands or a partnership with native vegetation. So I sort of I tried to sort of find some examples. Obviously if the um, the picture on the on your left is obviously that dried sort of cleared areas, you know, very little vegetation versus obviously the picture on your right, which shows obviously that partnership with with tree crops and native vegetation and the benefits that it can provide. And obviously my question to you, which one would you prefer? Now So when I was looking through you know, which elements of obviously the conventional and biological diversity that I could relate it to, I looked at a couple of different things. But I, I focused around Article 10, which I believe there's some, some specific elements there which I believe can relate to um, re-engaging with agri the agriculture industry to actually replant and expand the Brigalow Belt currently. And also <coughs> around the Ar Arche target, um, seven, which obviously um, is quite closely linked to that um, Article 10 from the Convention on Biological Diversity. That's it. Any questions or any feedback? Thank you, sir.
That's a challenging one for me to think of. I think, from my perspective, like you've got a clear international convention, um, and the implement, like the, your research task is to evaluate the implementation of an international regulatory framework in a country of your choice and make two or more policy recommendations. So um, you're looking at the implementation of the biodiversity convention. Um, I. To me, the issue of uh, um, improving soil, seeing Brigolo as um, soil management, uh, soil management mechanism, is probably part of the policy recommendations yep. um, for it. Uh, can it be seen? Because I've been, in, I've acted in cases involving tree clearing um, in the Brigolo, and pretty well farmers just, in my experience, see it as bloody awful scrub that is useless for. Yeah, man and dog and um, everything and just should be cleared um, and to you know that one thing and you know, might have an individual tree but if you've got it at what it, if you've got it at a density <coughs> that is going to be fixing enough nitrogen to improve the soil fertility then you've probably got basically zero grass cover so they clear the brigolo and then um, grass grows and then they graze cattle on that so I I personally don't see how it might work, that um, policy recommendation. Um, but you've, you've looked at it, um, that combination. I, um, I wonder whether you can simplify it uh, and just look at the conservation of Brigolo um, and say over the, you know, what's happening at present is a, is a particularly, like the Brigolo in its, in its um, own right is a good case study of Australia's implementation of biodiversity because you've got massive agricultural pressures, um, huge biodiversity interest or, or importance. Um, so it's got all of these pressures and in the last 15 years we've seen a massive increase in regulation of tree clearing which led to <coughs> spikes in clearing. We've now got a state government that's tried to relax clearing and has clearly indicated to farmers go your hardest, clear whatever you want and we won't prosecute you. So um, all of those things are in play. How well is it being protected now? I think that there's a um, there's enough in that and it's a significant research topic. Okay. Um, uh, <coughs> and, I, and I question the, the soil, fertility side of it. soil fertility side but I'm not an expert in soil fertility or farming and you may, it may be correct. So don't take my, you know, don't take my views too strongly on that. But I, I personally think you could simplify it and make it just about how well are we protecting Brigolo, and you could look at like the SLATS data, the statewide land and tree survey data, yeah. which looks at clearing in different regional ecosystems. And you might find in the last few years that it hasn't been published by the state government. They're pretty well stopped. And if you find a gap in information like that, what do you think of that? What do you think that that um, means for you as a researcher? One, they've got, maybe they've got something to hide, or...? Mm, maybe, but... Uh, that was like statistical consistency. Statistical consistency? Um, yeah, there's a big problem with them. Um, they're trying to stop a lot of the total records for the land, and they're like, well, uh, as a, uh, Yeah, as a policy analyst, simpler, simplify it. Okay, think in policy terms. You are basically a pol policy analyst in this um, research task. You are looking at the implementation of government policy. You know, the, you've got the international level, but it comes down through the national level, uh, and then it's implemented on the ground. So you are reviewing that, and you've got to make some recommendations for how it can be improved. If there's a gap in information... Uh, not necessarily. If there's a gap in information, you might not be able to actually fill that gap in information within your time and space available, but what can you say about it? Yes, voila, there's um, a chocolate for making recommendations. It is, in fact, take two. So, if you have a gap 
in information or there's something that isn't being done, voila, there's a really good policy recommendation. So if you look for SLATS data and they've got all these good reports up to a couple of years ago and then nothing's been published since, um, then your policy recommendation could be that because um, there's been some articles written about the changes in tree clearing laws that there's currently a lack of information about this. There's concern that you know there may be a return to um, broad scale clearing in the Brigalow. This is a major issue and that the government needs to publish um, regular SLATS reports so that the scientific community and the community generally can be aware about what's going on. You know, there's a really good practical policy recommendation um, staring you in the face. So any gaps in information you get, it's a good, you know, if you can identify a gap in information for your case study, that then becomes a very logical policy recommendation that that gap in information be filled if it's significant. And that, can you see that policy recommendation has flowed out of your research? and it's supported by the evidence that you presented. <coughs> and that's what you want for good policy recommendations. And that sort of one would be um, reasonably politically achievable um, in that you know publishing information is not, shouldn't be that controversial. <laughs> it would be for this government. But um, you know any re major recommendations for increasing the law or something to further protect Brigalow, um, not going to fly. I think you might also find it's not just um, tree clearing um, for broad scale agriculture, but there's um, probably been a huge amount of clearing in the last few years for coal seam gas. <coughs> so there's huge concern that there's a lot of fragmentation of the bricolo um, for coal seam gas. So think about those sorts of issues. And I, I just think restricted to that. Um, and you've got a much cleaner, clearer. Research topic? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's Does that sound fine? Yeah, good pleasure. Okay, cool. So, <laughs> uh, sorry, I, should have, I should have asked before I wrap that up. Has anyone got any questions? Um, are you all happy with that feedback? And do you agree with it? Do you think that that's. Uh, obviously, you don't necessarily know the, the details of Brigalow. I'm fairly familiar with it from. Um, just from my professional experience. Um, uh, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm also not familiar with the Brigolo, but um, my understanding of you know agricultural uses of leguminous plants for adding nitrogen to soil, the classic is that is like alfalfa, which is planted as a, co a cover crop, which yeah. uses nitrogen. That atmospheric nitrogen is converted into plant biomass, yeah. but in order for that nitrogen to be put back in the soil, that crop is plowed into yeah, it's the soil. Yeah, it's got to be, it's got to be. So plowed. unless they're plowing the brigolos back yeah. into the soil or chipping them or something, yeah. that nitrogen is sequestered into the organism, mm -hmm. except for a small amount of leaf litter, but this, yeah. is, this is essentially inconsequential levels of nitrogen. Yeah, okay, thanks. It's my yep. guess. Yeah, it's, 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 a pretty good, it's a pretty good guess, yeah. 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 Um, so Nick, thanks very much for being happy for me just to explain your grade. So I've given Nick four and a half in that his presentation was really good and clear. Um, I felt that the research design was a little bit unclear because it just sort of <coughs> didn't flow very well, but I think we've talked through that and that's the purpose of yeah. presenting it um, and, and, and everyone learning from it too. Um, so is that, is yeah, that okay? Right. Yeah, yeah, is, everyone, is everyone happy with that sort of marking? Does that sound fine? Um, okay, so oh, we're 35 past. It must my, my watch hasn't stopped, has it? It's 35 past six. Yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go one more and, and then see how we feel. Um, another volunteer? Yeah, do you want to come down? Okay. So, hang on, I'll, write, I'll just write here in the comments. Is it SLA you see here? Yeah, it's written there
Okay, so I think um, that after seeing the presentations and hearing the feedback, I could have probably switched a few things on here to get a higher mark. But my desire to get this over with is overriding that at this moment. <laughs> so, uh, but I think, I think I've got the major points. Um, so anyway, um, I'm going to mostly focus on the Peregrine Falcon as a great success, uh, which I thought was important for a couple of reasons. One being that it's so easy in conservation biology to hear the constant decline stories. And if anyone knows the story of the peregrine falcon, the population, just to give you a little bit of background, population crash. It's essentially completely extinct in local populations and major massive declines in the extant populations. Um, created a bit of a bottleneck, that's a whole other issue for the genetics of the peregrine falcon. Um, but essentially what I wanted to try to investigate is why. You know, what under the uh, conservation uh, of migratory species of wild animals international framework, um, what role did that play? Um, and is there anything that we can learn from that model? And could be applied to species that are in decline, other migratory species and even perhaps non-migratory species. What about the peregrine falcon um, made it successful? Was it this international framework or was it perhaps something else, which we'll talk about a little bit here. Um, so here's just a bit of the range of the peregrine falcon. Basically every major landmass except for New Zealand. Um, the only other bird with larger distribution is the rock pigeon or the dove or pigeon, whatever, uh, which incidentally the peregrine falcon eats for breakfast. So that's kind of a <laughs> handy little thing for him. Um, so anyway, this keep in mind the massive distribution because I think that may also be um, a key to the peregrine success because everyone around the world knows the bird, so maybe that's part of it. Maybe that's something that I like to investigate. So yeah, who gets the credit for the return of the peregrine falcon is going to be sort of a, a, an interesting point. Um, is it really uh, CMS? Or here's a quote from the website of the Peregrine Fund, which were instrumental in restoring the peregrine falcon, um, that this was taken off the endangered species list in 99, um, thanks to the efforts of the Peregrine Fund and other organizations and individuals. So, so was this a grassroots effort? Was this something that communities came together in an international framework was actually irrelevant or, or um, harmful? Or was it a combination of the both? Um, and then just for in terms of significance for me, um, I wanted to put a picture of my mom in here, but she couldn't get one to me because she worked with them before they had digital cameras. So that's not my mom, but she did. <laughs> <laughs> She did work on uh, raptors for the majority of her life, and I had, um, you know, bird gloves and hoods and things as a kid. Um, anyone recognize the picture from the top there? Yosemite. Yosemite yeah. National Park. I'm from California, and um, spent a lot of time in Yosemite. Um, and this thing. Yeah, yeah, half dome. Watching a column. This is Leaning Tower. And if you're in, if you're like me, and you find this exciting, <laughs> this is how you like to spend your life. Um, Did you get eight out of five? <laughs> 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 so, um, when, uh, so what, what is, uh, you know, besides having uh, a dad for a mom who you likes... You get 15 out of five if that's you. That is me. That is me. That, is me. That, was, that was actually published in a uh, rock climbing magazine. But... As, uh, <laughs> Are we going to request a copy of the article? Yeah. I have it. I have it. I brought it. Yes, I have it. <laughs> um, so anyway, so what, what you see uh, here and here are, this is actually a photo, these are photographs that I've taken. Um, this is for Peregrine Falcon, the, the text, I guess, isn't coming too clear here. This is from Lover's Leap, which is a rock climbing area just near Yosemite. So here we see some of like the effects of, um, you know, part of it, it was this part of it, was this the success? Is this part of that community knowledge? Um, the rock climbing community wanted to be very sensitive for where the peregrines nest and cliff sides and have here it's showing this is a, a topographic map of rock climbs and this section is being closed um, for peregrine falcon nesting. So uh, are, are, do those have, you know, rock climbing isn't any part of the Conservation for Migratory Species International Act or whatever. Um, so is it, is it possible that these actions are, are, were, were the bigger driving force? 
Um, here, actually, you see um, some of my shoes and, and ropes here. This is, a, this is a vacated nest, so don't worry, this isn't dead peregrines, this is their lunch. So the peregrines have fledged, and then uh, rock climbers have been instrumental um, with that technical knowledge um, to be able to monitor and look at you know, diets of peregrine falcons and, and things like that. So, yeah, those are the general questions in the framework that I'm working with. So, that's it. Great. So does anyone have any questions before I Where do you go rock climbing in Greece? Pardon me? Where do you go rock climbing in Greece? Kangaroo point. Kangaroo <laughs> point. Um, I have a question. Sure. Because the path is up to the top, but the main policy recommendation is to the climb the accomplish with that? Very good. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so I think um, my, poli my policy recommendations, <laughs> my, my policy recommendations would be based on basically, you know, learning from this case study, the Peregrine Falcon, um, and are, are there recommendations based on the success story that we can, that we can make recommendations for other migratory species or species in general? So the, yeah, the, the policy recommendations would be, um, you know what? What components of this plan should be imp could be implemented elsewhere? Or can I? Okay. Or maybe you can like um, choose another case study, another migratory bird or migratory species <coughs> in which you can, you know, apply apply that uh, that uh, successful management. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm saying. Because I'm thinking on changing. You know. It, it Changing, but yeah, it's your, <laughs> it's your topic, it's not mine. Like, uh, focusing on other migratory species and uh, include the case study of that successful case. That's just no, yeah, that's, I think that's exactly what I'm trying, that's what, exactly what I'm saying is, yeah, like, so the, the, what made this a success, can we apply that, make recommendations for current species in decline? Uh, other questions? Uh, so, I thought those were really good. Uh, had a clear international framework coming down to a clear case study. In, you're focusing on a particular species, but it's an interesting case study because it doesn't really go within any single nation. So, it's um, really looking at the implementation across many jurisdictions. I, I think I'll probably focus on North and South America because that's what the uh, laws banning DDT. If, if, again, if the background here is the Peregrine Falcon was crashing because of organophosphate <coughs> pesticides, insecticides that were used in South America predominantly, um, that then it was bioaccumulating the eggshell, yep. was forming too thin and crushing that. Yeah. That all sounds great then. Um, you can focus in on, on that and paint the wider picture. Um, so that's all nice and clear. Um, much as I love the pictures of Yosemite, um, <laughs> Uh, I think that's probably going too specific, um, okay. so I wouldn't probably put them in your final research paper because I just, uh, you know, looking at the programs that were say done by rock climbers, I wonder then about the actual applicability to other. Like it's wonderful that what's been done, but if you're looking for broader um, policy recommendations. Because that's, I think, the key question that I'd have is you've got such a popular species that's been really well studied. Um, yes, it's a success story, and yes, your recommendation can be to keep doing what we're doing, but actually coming up with some good policy recommendations that are insightful is actually probably the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so you could bring it down to a specific program, but that's... I, I don't mind, though. I mean... You obviously love the species. It brings in a lot of things for you. Do it. Don't don't be held back by by that. You know you obviously love it, and it's got a lot of meaning for you. So I'm happy for you, more than happy for you to do it. Um, and you may well, you know, come out with something um, useful for other species. And that's you know, if you can come up with something insightful, original, great. That would be. A good, you know, something significant. Um, does that sound okay to you guys? So, um, Chris, you don't mind me talking about Mark? So, so for it. Um, I've given Chris five. I did 
honestly think about the 15, but there might be a few objections. Flash of pictures, guys. Um, uh, and so, um, I'm limited to five, unfortunately. Um, and so, anyone else who wants to bring in pictures of Yosemite um, in your presentation, however, odd of all, and uh, let me joke. Keep your, keep your presentations um, focused on what's relevant. But um, I've said, well done, uh, a very clear research design. You may struggle to make good policy recommendations for such a well-studied species. That was my uh, thought as well. But, um, you know, it's so, it's so interesting. It's such an interesting case study. <coughs> By all means, go for it. So, um, I'll give you that. Does everyone um, think that, does it agree with mm -hmm. those comments back? Do you see that um, how we're basically, um, and, and hopefully it's really interesting too to learn from, like I hadn't really heard that sort of story um, before from that angle, uh, and also to personalise it as well um, is really cool. So um, I really like these presentations, so it's so interesting to hear from folk. Um, Thank you. Um, from folk all around the world of you know problems and things that interest them and case studies that are relevant to them. Um, it's quarter two. Um, shall we call it a night tonight? Uh, and we've gotten the basic idea of what we're doing. We um, uh, we probably don't need to be as long on presentations um, in the in the future. Don't feel you have to stand there for five or ten minutes explaining your research design. I'm really just looking for, are you in the right ballpark? Sure, um, you, know, you can go on and explain <coughs> some interesting details about your case study. Uh, you don't really need to explain the, um, the international frameworks very much at all. Just, you know, the interest is in, for listeners, is in um, the case studies that you're looking at. So by all means, flesh those out, the sort of issues that are confronting whatever issue you're looking at. But don't feel that, you know, it's actually quite simple. Um, I'm just looking at, are you in the right ballpark? And if you are, I'm happy to give you that feedback and let you move forward. And you'll hear from other people as well, so you'll hear the feedback that they get, uh, and that might help you refine your projects. So everyone happy? Yeah. Any questions? No, if anyone's got any particular questions, you're welcome to chat with me after. So thanks, guys.